Network. Thank you all for joining this evening. I'm Dr. Jackie Gamino. I am a cognitive neuroscientist from the University of Texas at Dallas Center for Brain Health. So I am also a mom. Um, I have a boy and a girl who have weathered this. I've weathered the storm with them through their adolescence, and um, thankfully they are now adults and we all made it. Um, very happy to say that. I'm really excited to speak with you tonight about keeping your own brains healthy as well as that of your students. Um, before we get started, let's get my slides to cooperate. Um, before we get started, just a few things. Um, if you're um, not familiar with Zoom, the best uh, view you will get Tonight is from uh, the speaker view, which is in the far right corner, um, top right corner of your screen. If you're on an iPhone, um, you don't have quite as many options. Um, but um, we also want you to be sure and type your questions into the chat, um, mainly because, you know, I'm speaking to a bunch of boxes tonight, and that at least lets me know that. You all are still with me and um, I appreciate that. And we're happy to answer as many and all questions as we can. That is our goal is to help, help you feel comfortable with the information that you learned tonight. Um, all your videos and your, um, and your, uh, your microphones are muted um, just so that we're not a distraction to each other. Um, and this, I wanted to tell you that this presentation is going to be recorded. So um, if you want to um, watch it later, it will be, it, you'll be able to do so as well as for people who couldn't join us tonight. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you think about it, um, let's talk about your teenagers. They're emotional, they're social, they can be very rude, they can be argumentative, um, they can take a lot of necessary risks um and even but even the shyest teenager wants to have connections and this is how they used to look right this is how we all used to look um because we're human and our ability to socialize is really important um, for our brain health um that's kind of been shattered by the pandemic and now we have kids who look lonely they're alone they often look stressed they don't have their usual social connections to rely on. Did you realize that most of our kids go to school only to be with their friends and it has nothing to do with what they learn. They just wanna be with their friends. That was news to me. Um, many parents of course need to go to their jobs and leave their children home alone to either work independently to learn and follow their own school schedule. Just, they simply don't have another choice. And other parents, of course, are stretched between doing their jobs and working with their children, trying to be pseudo teachers and help with school assignments and technology, pretty much everything. So people are everywhere are really stressed with this. Um, face it, we're all becoming IT specialists, surrogate teachers and entertainers. We're PE teachers and math teachers we're all just trying to do our jobs and ensure our homes are functioning. And sometimes we have to squeeze in work wherever and whenever we can. And it is taking a toll for sure on all of us. And we're exhausted, right? Absolutely exhausted. Um, and then there's the worry, you know, how are our kids really doing? Are they, are they weathering the storm? Are they feeling lonely? Are they feeling isolated? And so we, we're thinking about them as well, which adds to our own stress. But some things that we know from brain science is that nature is actually associated with an improvement in the symptoms of stress and depression. There's evidence that nature can reduce feelings of pain. Families who gather in backyards or parks have less stress. A brain healthy habit for you and your children is to take advantage of nature, um, to get out there and do something different. And believe it or not, nature is really, really good for the brain. Um, another thing that's really good for the brain is mindful breathing, doing mindfulness. So all you have to do, it's pretty simple, is take a deep breath as you count to four and then release it as you count to six. So let's do that together tonight just to get us started. So take a really deep breath one, two, three, four, 
and release it. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'll try it one more time. Take a deep breath in. One, two, three, four, and release. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is something that you can teach your kids to do. You can do it whenever. You can do it in the car. You can do it in the shower carefully. Um, but it's really important to give your, your, your brain a chance to not only oxygenate, but also to just take that deep, refreshing breath and help relax some of that stress that we're all feeling. As a brain scientist, I love to talk about the brain and how people can keep their brains healthy. Um, and really it's simple exercises such as the one that we just did um, that can help maintain and regain brain health. Um, the brain is our most important organ. A lot of people think about the heart as being more important, but it's actually the brain that controls the heart and everything that we do. It controls everything that we think, what we like, what we dislike, and even our discomfort. Um, it all starts with signals from the brain. And the brain is really our last frontier in science of the body because it's locked away behind the skull and it's been very difficult to reach um, to understand it better. But we're doing better and better with our technology and brain imaging that helps us understand what's happening in the brain. What's really important to know is that your young adolescents are going through more de brain development now than they will at any other time in life. And the only other time in life that they have um, undergone this much development was in infancy. So a lot of things are happening in the teen brain. And at many of the different areas of the teen brain um, develop at an earlier stage than other parts. So for instance, this down here, if you can see my pointer, the amygdala is the emotional center of the brain. And if you haven't noticed, um, teenage, teenagers become extremely emotional at this time. Um, they are, they're, their amygdalas are very, very active. And what we know is that the amygdala is not yet well connected to the frontal lobes, which is the part of the brain that helps us reason and understand. Um, as we develop, um, those connections get stronger. But in the teenage brain in particular, it's very hard for them to reason through their emotions. So some of the other areas of the brain that are changing quite rapidly are the cor corpus callosum, which is where the two sides of the brain have connections, and also the basal ganglia. And that's where a lot of our brain chemistry comes from. And so the fact that these are going under the development at this point in time, it's really important to know that your children's brain chemistry along with the neurons in their brains are ch is changing. So what happens is when your children are young, um, up until about age 11 for girls and 12 for boys, they develop a lot of connections in their brains. Their brains are changing and growing. And then right around puberty, what happens is, um, the, a lot of those connections that haven't been used begin to be what we call pruned away. And of course, it's not that you have little scissors in your brain, but it's chemical reactions within the brain that gets rid of some of those connections in order for the brain to be more efficient. And so in that process, different areas of the brain um, are actually becoming stronger. Um, the frontal lobes and the reasoning and the problem solving actually begins to develop and grow very rapidly during these years. But the frontal lobe of the brain is the last area of the brain to develop. To develop. It doesn't develop until children are about 25. So there's a lot going on, especially in the beginning of adolescence, that begins to um, that begins to change the way they act, the way they feel, and it's a difficult time for them, and it's also a difficult time at, for you all to put up with them. Um, all right. So this is actually some brain images that were done um, looking at development in children from five to about 10 years along this line. And as you can see, this along here on the top half of this image are, is looking at the side, side view of the brain. So the areas that you see that are blue are the areas that are changing and developing with age. 
And the, the view at the bottom are actually um, the brains looking from the top of the head down. So you can see the changes that are happening. And this is just between five and 10 years. And then when teenage, um, the teenage years hit, you can see this massive amount of developing and changing that's going on in the brain. You can see um, all in the frontal lobes, there's a lot of development um, as, as children become young adults. This is an animation of that same development. So as you can see, it's almost as though um, the areas of brain, which are signified by the blue that's coming on the brain, um, it starts sort of at the bottom of the brain and then again at the top of the brain and up around the sides. And some of the last areas to develop are right here in the frontal lobes. And one of the very last areas of activation to develop is an area called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Now that's the area of the brain that's activated when we use empathy, when we understand someone else's feelings. So a lot of times teenagers get blamed for being selfish or for not caring when actually their brains just haven't developed enough for them to be very good at taking the perspective and understanding the emotions of others. That of course can change and it's different for each child. Um, and what changes the, the brain is the environment and the actions and the thought patterns and everything that um, is associated with that child begins to change and develop the brain. All right, so you all have probably heard about serotonin. It is a very important brain chemical. It's really our feel good chem chemical in our brains, which is of course exemplified by the little smiley faces here. There are other chemicals in the brain that um, also help us feel good. They're ones like dopamine, norepinephrine. Um, and they work together with serotonin to really elevate our mood, to make us feel good. So as you can see from this example on the left, it's pretty complicated the way that our brain exchanges serotonin. Um, it happens between two connections of, an, of two different neurons. Um, the neurons, um, the dendrite from one um, releases some of the serotonin and dumps it onto the receiving cell at the axon. And as you can see from the example on the right, the graphic on the right, um, the serotonin is really important for all aspects of the brain. It goes all over the brain and it actually also goes down into the body and it's very important for um, what we call gut function or intestinal function. So there's a really strong connection between what's going on in your brain and the rest of your body. Um, so there's that, that, that interaction of the serotonin and the different chemi brain chemicals. All right. Um, let's see. So this is an image of a connection between a dendrite and an axon, two different, um, two different neurons, and you can see um, what is, what is highlighted are the different chemicals that the two um, the two neurons are exchanging. So what it's important to know is that um, these connections between neurons um, is, are really, really important. And there are actually billions and billions of connections in, your, in our brains, which is pretty amazing, right? Um, but because the brain is very plastic, um, we can change, we actually have the capacity to change the chemistry in our brains, depending upon what we do, what we think. Um, and that's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, brain plasticity lasts throughout life. It's extremely, uh, the brain is extremely plastic during development, like in adolescence. And then, um, but we can still change and make changes to our brain, even when we are 80, 90 years old. Um, so that's really good news. Um, and whatever, whatever we do, the things that we do to help our brain um, are really important. So things like good nutrition, eating fruits and vegetables, eating you know, very few sweets, all of that helps with our brain chemistry. Getting exercise also helps with our brain chemistry. So here's another example of a brain connection. Um, and 
some ideas for elevating serotonin is different ways that you can think about aspects of your life. The pandemic has been hard on everybody and it's been hard on our kids. And the stress level, of course, for all of us is high. But one of the things that we can do is focus our attention in a very positive way and focus it on thinking about finding the positive in all situ as many situations as we can. And that's not me meaning to be not realistic with our children, but helping them see that, yes, the pandemic has been hard, but we're going to get through this. And that's what's important is giving kids that sense of hope. So what happens with the brain chemistry is when we begin to get down and depressed, are, it changes our serotonin level. And so it is really important um, that we try not to let the serotonin level get so low that we become clinically depressed. And, and some of the ways that we can alleviate some of the stress that's involved is really learning to focus our attention and focus it very deliberately on things that are even not important. Think about little children how they become very fascinated with just about everything, right? They pick up a rock and they turn it over and they look at it. They have very focused attention when they're interested in something. And we as adults tend to just brush, brush things off because we think it's commonplace. But if we look for the novelty in even the most basic things, we are really, um, we're igniting our brain and we're helping with our own curiosity. Another proven um, method of Im improving depression and stress is expressing gratitude. And that seems like such a simple thing. It seems like such a soft thing, but there really is evidence um, when we feel grateful um, for even the most basic of um, basic things that we have in life, that it begins to change our brain chemistry. One of the exercises that I like to do is to think about what I'm, where I'm grateful in a negative situation. So the pandemic, for example, um, what are we grateful for? It's taken a lot of what we are used to away, but it's also given us more family time. And for many of us, it's given us less of a commute. Um, for some, it's taken away jobs. For others, it's given jobs. So if we can find ways to kind of turn ideas on their end, and think about what a positive way to approach it, it really does begin to change our brain chemistry and that's important. Laughter is one of the best ways to give yourself a serotonin and a dopamine boost. Um, whether it's watching funny videos together as a family or telling jokes or just um, you know laughing about some of the mundane things that happen in life. Um, having connections. Um, if family's not nearby, making phone calls, if um, encouraging your child to connect with their friends, to have Zoom calls. Zoom is a free application that you don't have to pay for um, if you're not going to use it for long meetings. You can have short meetings with family and friends. Um, and we en encouraging that connection is really important to make sure that your, your students feel like they're socially connected. And then, like I said before, with focusing your attention and awakening your curiosity, becoming more curious about your child, instead of just taking something that they say at face value, ask them more about it, ask them how they feel about it, dig a little bit deeper, um, you're going to learn a lot about your child, and your child's going to feel respected. And I think that's one thing that's so difficult for children is they don't feel like they could have much control, and they often don't feel respected. And the feeling of respect, if you think about it, when someone shows you respect, it makes you feel good on the inside. But that's because it started in your brain with those chemicals that make us feel better. Um, we talked about focused attention, but joyful attention is another way to increase your serotonin level. Um, to really, you know, think about how you felt the first time you met your significant other, or maybe the first time that you saw your child. Um, think of that joy that you felt. And if you can approach that grumbly looking teenage face with that same joy, um, you are not only gonna change your serotonin level, but your child is going to feel a change in their serotonin level as well. 
Um, also, inspiring creativity and novelty is a great way to increase um, your serotonin levels. So think about it, um, something as simple as asking a silly question. Um, and I do this um, with my colleagues a lot, is if you could be any animal, what would you be and why would you be it? Or here's one that one of my colleagues posed. If you could be a potato, how would you want to be cooked? Right? So, and, and why would you want to be cooked that way? What is it about being cooked in that way that would be special to you or that would you like? Um, so, I mean, you can go anywhere with questions like that, but it just sparks that creativity, that novelty, that's something that's different. And our brain loves things that are new and novel. And that's why sometimes we feel like we're in a rut when we see the same people every day. Um, so we need to, but we need to look for the positives and look for that novelty in order to spark that serotonin. Here's a, here's a novelty, a dog reading a newspaper, right? Um, we know, of course, that when we talk about brain health and mental health, that sometimes people feel stigmatized by brain health and mental health. And what's important to know is that when someone has a mental health difference, an, an issue such as depression, it's just like any other health issue. So when you're sick, your doctor will often draw blood or take your temperature in order to realize that there's something's off in the chemistry of your, of, of your blood or within your body that's changing the way that you feel. The same is true of mental health. It's just a difference in the chemistry. Your chemistry gets off and there's nothing wrong if your chemistry is so far off that you can't find joy in anything to seek help. And it's very important to seek help and to be aware of that in your child. The worst thing that you can do to somebody who's suffering from a very deep depression is tell them to snap out of it because they simply cannot snap out of it. Their brain chemistry is too, um, too misadjusted. And so it is very important to seek out help. Um, there are ways too that you as a parent can look for help or look for other signs that maybe your child is having an issue. And I don't know if you can see this screen down here, but I have, this is just um, a, a self-administered depression test that you can take to help you um, and, or have your child take to help you figure out whether or not you really should be bringing in a mental health professional. Um, it really helps you see the difference uh, because a lot of times, you know, you see your child every day, they may be tired or bored or, you know, just kind of tired of school. And so sometimes there are subtle little changes that take place over time that you're just not aware of. And as a parent, you know, sometimes we beat ourselves up thinking, oh my gosh, I should have recognized it in my child. But sometimes you just don't. And sometimes you can't. And sometimes children try to hide it. Um, so take care of your brain health, take care of your mental health. Um, I'm going to turn um, the, the talking over to Shirley Weddle, who is a community activist in Mesquite and who has all sorts of resources um, to help you. Shirley? Thank you, Dr. Gamino, for that great presentation and for helping us to understand more about the brain, how it develops and how what we do as part of our daily life can affect behavior and emotions and how we perform in different ways. Plus helping us understand how we as families can support each other and to recognize when emotions and actions signal something that's more serious that we need to follow up on with the mental health professional. I know that when our son Matthew was a student at Kimbra, I wish that I had known more of this information back then. So as an advocate, um, I know as parents, we do the best we can with what we know at the time. And that's why it's so important for us to have this information this evening. And I'm really grateful to Lauren for asking the questions of her parents about what's important. And for all of you parents for letting her know that this is a topic that's really important to you and that you wanted to learn more about. So in addition to the resources that we know about from Lauren and from our school system, we have a lot of resources in the Mesquite area that you may not be aware of. 
For example, mental health is so important in Mesquite that our mayor, Bruce Archer, and our city leaders have worked with the Azar Foundation to offer free mental health services to any resident in Mesquite, free of charge, either individual, family, or group counseling. I have the number on the screen that you can call for that. And by the way, we're gonna provide the list of resources to you so you don't have to worry about writing all these down. We'll provide them to you afterwards. Also, we have a center in Mesquite at Beltline and 80 called the Multicultural Recovery Center. They offer bilingual services, uh, mental health or counseling, as well as medication monitoring. The uh, National Alliance of Mental Illness, known as NAMI, uh, also has a number of resources available. Right now during COVID, a lot of the things that they're doing is uh, over Zoom as opposed to in person, but uh, both are gonna be available in the future. They offer peer-to-peer -peer support groups for families and individuals. There's no cost to attend. They also have programs for parents and caregivers with children called NAMI Basics, and as well as a program called Ending the Silence. That's a program that's normally provided to middle and high school students, but also they have a version available for parents. So if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, please let Lauren know, we'll be glad to follow up on that. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention also has a number of resources talking about depression in middle school and high school students, especially the program called More Than Sad. You can go to their website and see, uh, find information about those resources. And of course, if ever you're in crisis, please call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, which is available 24 seven. I've provided the information uh, on the screen for that. In addition, as Jackie was talking earlier about creativity and being able to connect and do things with your families, uh, we have resources at the Mesquite Public Library. Right now, you're able to check out eBooks so you don't actually have to go in and get physical books. So you can read along with your child and whatever book they're reading for school. They also have movies that you can check out for family time. The Mesquite Arts Center uh, has free art projects available every week. I think this next week they're making Mardi Gras masks. So you can go by and pick up kits and do things within the family for that sort of thing. Also, uh, I wanted to mention that other uh, projects might be to Maybe if you're artistic, just send cards, make cards and send to people that you haven't seen in a while, maybe to grandparents or aunts and uncles. Um, it's always special to get those homemade cards and you don't always think about that. But that's a way to use your creativity. Also, you may have uh, the desire to share your art with other kiddos. So maybe you send cards to the hospital or to the uh, residents at the uh, uh, Christian care centers and things like that to make their day a little brighter. You might go back and play those games that you played when you were kids and uh, didn't have cell phones to use. Maybe card games or dominoes, things like that. Maybe work just jigsaw puzzles together, uh, cook together, learn something new together. There's all sorts of things that you can do. And we'll be glad to share all that type of information with you if you're interested. And especially if you want to mail things and you don't have stamps and cards and uh, envelopes, we'll be glad to help you with that also. Just check in with Lauren. Now we have time for some questions and answers. I don't know if anyone has submitted anything in the chat box. Uh, Lauren, can you help us with checking on that? Hey everybody again, no one has written anything in the chat. So if you do have a question, feel free to unmute your mic if you wanna ask or go ahead and write that in the chat so we can get any questions answered. Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, yes we have a question. We just want to know what would be the side of- One of the signs uh, to notice when your child is having or starting to have depression um, typically, it is um, a change, a severe changes in mood, especially, um, you know, if, if really nothing seems to, um, to make your child happy. If you, you don't hear them laughing with friends, um, or they become extremely withdrawn, or they, their personality changes drastically. And it's not something that you can, you know, that is changed by, um, you know, doing something different with them or 
you know, often too, they just lose interest in things that they used to really enjoy. So those are some of the warning signs that it might be a severe depression. You know, if, if your child is feeling like that from time to time and you're able to maybe have a change of scene, take a family ride or get out and do something different, take a walk through a park or one of the tr local trails and that elevates the mood, then it, it may not be severe depression. Um, the link that I shared um, at the bottom of my screen, and, and I can give that to Miss Burke and she can send it out as well, is just a little um, a self-check um, that's online that you can use to see how the lev what level of depression your child might be feeling. That's Thank a great you. Question. Thank you. That's a good question. Sometimes it's helpful too that if you're feeling sort of down, you might have a list of things available that make you feel better, like listening to music or taking a walk or something like that. And maybe even do that as a family activity because we all get somewhat depressed at times uh, or have stressful times. So that's something you could do as a family activity also, just to see how you could help each other and then remind each other when you start to feel that way. If you have any other questions after tonight, uh, please uh, just pass them along to Lauren and we'd be glad to get back with you on that. Uh, we will be sharing all these resources with you so that you can think about those and, um, and look into some of the uh, links that we shared with you. Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your attention tonight. Yes, thank you. Stay warm.